only at the Indianapolis Zoo. Hi, my name is Sydney. I work here at the Indianapolis Zoo, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about corals. So corals are actually a really interesting animal that we have here that you can see when you come visit the zoo. And it is a fun fact because a lot of people think they do look like plants or maybe colorful rocks, but they actually are animals. So corals are a colonial animal. They're made up of hundreds or even thousands of tiny polyps that live in um, a calcium carbonate shell that they create themselves. So it's really fascinating and they have some really cool features that not a lot of people think about when you do see them. We have quite a few different species here. We've got monopora in multiple colors. We've got candy cane corals, toadstool corals, horn corals, brain corals, and even more. One fascinating thing about corals, they aren't very mobile animals. They do anchor themselves to the ground and create that calcium carbonate shell to protect themselves, but they do feed in multiple ways. So corals are covered in a mucus-like substance that can actually trap any particles that are floating by that they can use and absorb the nutrients. They also have tentacles. They are related to cnidarians like jellyfish and anemones, and they have um, what are called nematocysts, which are stinging cells in those tentacles. They can use that to stun and trap prey such as zooplankton, and that's another way they can provide their food. But perhaps the largest amount of their diet they actually get from a helpful algae that they have that lives inside those shells with them. So they have a really important symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae, which is a type of algae that does live inside of coral shells. So these zooxanthellae actually provide most of their diet by photosynthesis. And another thing that they provide is they provide that beautiful vibrant color you're going to see in a lot of different corals. It, because it is a symbiotic relationship, that just means that these two organisms coexisting do provide things for each other and they both have a mutual benefit. So like I said, the corals do get most of their diet and their color from the zooxanthellae and the algae in return get nutrients from the animals as well as getting protection by being able to reside in that hard shell as well. So if you guys notice, those beautiful colors are what you're usually going to see with corals. However, they can lose those colors if they go through what's called coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is going to be whenever that animal gets overly stressed by environmental changes such as higher water temperatures or ocean acidification or even pollution can cause the animals to stress and expel that algae, which is why they lose those bright, vibrant colors. There are quite a few things we can do to help, such as reducing our use of single-use plastics to reduce pollution in the ocean. We can also work to turn off lights when we're not using them and carpool whenever we have the chance to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. And we can also, whenever you guys go to the ocean and go for a swim, look for sunscreen that has coral-safe chemicals in it. Uh, corals do form together to form reefs that actually do buffer the waves and help protect the coastlines. And although corals, coral reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, they are home to 25% of marine life. So animals like sea turtles or lots of tropical fish and stingrays rely on a healthy ocean environment and a healthy coral reef to survive. So that's millions of species that rely on these tiny, tiny animals. Here at the Indianapolis Zoo, we have different species such as Ocellaris clownfish, we've got different kinds of tangs, surgeon fish, and butterfly fish, just to name a few species that you might see that would thrive in a coral reef. Thank you guys for joining us and learning some more about our corals here at the Indianapolis Zoo. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and I hope you guys stay healthy out there.